Hello listeners, and welcome to A Dash of Salt with AJ. I'm your host, Ahsoka Jackson, author, podcaster, poet, and freelance proofreader. Okay, this episode was awesome. Once again. It was so fascinating to finally start seeing more of what had been going on in these intervening years since the end of Season 3. I've seen bits of it, but didn't have a thorough picture. So things are really unfolding for me here, and it's great. I feel like the authorities on Paradis went too far in how they treated the Marlene volunteers once Aaron and Zeke had returned, but I was glad in general that they were exercising due caution. Yelena in particular admits serious craziness and instability vibes, and then I definitely understand not trusting Zeke. So if the people in that group of Marleans are following Yelena and Zeke, then it definitely makes sense to be very cautious. Especially now that Zeke is actually on Paradise Island to potentially influence them more directly. Plus, Aaron himself has evidently gone off the reservation some as well, so who knows what might be about to happen next, right? But drawing guns on them and everything, especially after three years of cooperation? Like I said, the caution itself is wise, but the way it's being demonstrated is not something I'm pleased with. And then we have Falco and Gabby. I hadn't known where the heck they were during this early part of the events after arriving back on Paradise, so I'm glad we had that little check-in with them. It looks like they're recovering okay. And Gabby, doesn't it feel nostalgic? Just replace Aaron Yeager with Titans, and there you go. That fixation and that seething with rage and a desire to kill. Gabby could be his little sister. Actually, that's a really fun thought for me, a scenario where Aaron actually ends up as an older brother figure to Gabby. And the most hilarious thing about that is that Aaron would now be the calmer one in the dynamic, and he'd just be there chilling and telling her to cool down before she burns herself out prematurely. Of course, everyone else would just be looking at him in shock, mouths open. <laughs> kind of reminds me of what I said before about Hanja, although a huge difference is that Aaron both has self-awareness and is willing to express some of the observations that come with that self-awareness. This is something I've said about him before, that he's willing and able to examine himself, and he's also willing to admit the things he realizes. I feel like Hanja has a twofold issue. First off, I feel like she does genuinely have issues with self-awareness. I think she's so outwardly focused and so focused on whatever external goals she's chasing that the introspective side or potential side of herself is neglected by Hanja. And I think the other issue is that, to the extent that she is aware of certain problems, she's unwilling to admit them too much because she's afraid of undermining her authority as a leader. She was already thrust into this position unexpectedly, and she definitely seems like one of those people who wouldn't be especially inclined to pursue a leadership position, aside from maybe heading up the scientific team. And following in Ervin's footsteps is definitely a whole heck of a lot of pressure. But with the advice I've heard from folks in leadership positions, it may sound counterintuitive, but it's actually more effective to be more honest and open about your flaws and vulnerabilities as a leader. No one's perfect, and it's important that you be able to acknowledge that in general, and acknowledge that to your subordinates. It demonstrates both self-awareness and humility. Those qualities help show that you are trustworthy, that you're probably going to be capable of listening and accepting advice and help from others, and it shows that you aren't just scrutinizing them while giving yourself a free pass. And I feel like this will probably be all the more important in Hanja's case, because her subordinates, including Aaron and Armin, have seen some of her flaws and her wild behavior up close and personal. Like I was saying in my reaction to prior episodes, they were right there to witness various moments, and they were involved in those moments themselves as well. So she can't play them like they're ignorant of all of this. Of course... For her acknowledgement of past behavior to be effective, there would also need to be some amends that there are issues with it. She can't just say, I was the same, but I won't let you be. She needs to say, I was reckless, and that was indeed a problem. For me, knowing that someone screwed up in the past can actually make them all the more compelling as a voice of advice regarding why I shouldn't go down that same path. Because they're saying they went down that path, and it freaking cost them, so they know from experience how much it sucks. And I myself am someone who's been on both sides of that equation. I've been the person giving the warnings and the person receiving them. But a key factor in said equation is admitting that a problem existed in the first place. And that's another thing that I'm not sure Hanja is willing to do right now. Admit not only to the fact of her behavior, but also admit that maybe she shouldn't have been chasing after times like a jonesing addict looking for a hit. 
I'm not saying she shouldn't have pursued information. She definitely should have. But just what I said about Paradis's current behavior, it's the manner of it that I object to. And I already know at this point in time that I am not the only one who is thoroughly done with Honda's shiznit. Oh, before I move on, my friend and I were talking about Honda, and especially that moment where she just about gave me a heart attack, literally staring down the barrel of that firearm. Dear God, don't ever do that. I've actually seen real life folks do that. It is the scariest freaking shiz. I was fussing at the darn screen during that scene. But my friend was saying that Hanja is basically one of those really smart, dumb people. She says she's high intellect, but low wisdom. <laughs> that really feels accurate. And honestly, when she said that, it also made me think of Aaron some again. He and Hanja are both highly intelligent in some ways, but they also have moments of just choosing to act like completely complete freaking jack-offs, and you just want to smack them for their sheer idiocy. I will say I think Aaron has a better strategic streak than Hanja, alongside having the general intelligence, though. Oh, that brings me back to something else I realized as we were speaking after episode 9. You know how I mentioned with episode 8, Sapphire's awesome observation that's like Aaron's taking on rougher or lower quality versions of his friend's best traits? She pointed out how he's become more outwardly cold and restrained like Mikasa used to be. And I was thinking about Armin's strategic and planning abilities. But after watching episode 9, I also thought about a point someone made about how, over time, we see Armin and Eren switch when it comes to worldview. Armin, the very one who actually gave Eren the whole spiel about the need to abandon your humanity and become a monster yourself in order to defeat monsters, yeah, Armin has now become more wide-eyed and optimistic over time. Meanwhile, Aaron, he already had a cynical streak as a youngster, but over time he embraces further that cynical perspective that Armin had. And you really get to see both those elements play out and actually clash directly some in this episode. It's probably one of the most fascinating things uh, we see this time, and this episode was just full of goodness. It's primarily a character and world building episode. But just like Declaration of War, it's just packed with so much great information that's super foundational for the season and the story as a whole at this point. Plus, we actually did get some gush-worthy little action moments here, too. They weren't high speed, but they were high impact. I mean, it was insanely cool, but I'll get to that later. Right now, what I want to focus on is that key scene with the EMA or Shinoshina trio. This is what I'd like to get into for the next episode of the podcast. I want to talk about the general dynamic, some specific lines, and also a key point about the timeline. Additionally, episode 9 has been one of those episodes where I've been reading comments a lot, and I've seen plenty of great points and catches being made by other fans, so I look forward to sharing some of those, as I already did with Sapphire's notes about Hanja. Oh, very quickly, regarding another shared trait between Armin and Eren. Remember the link I made before? Someone pointed out that Reiner has a manipulative streak, and then I noted that this is one of the parallels we also see between Reiner and Season 4 Eren. And one thing I just realized is that the skills of influencing and outright manipulating people are also in Armin's repertoire as well. So that's another example of how Eren is increasingly resembling his friends. Alright guys, thanks for listening to you today, and I hope you've had a great time. If you're enjoying the podcast, please don't forget to subscribe and turn your notifications on so you can get updates. You can help make the podcast more visible for new viewers and listeners by leaving a like, share, comment, or review on whichever platform you used to listen. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, social media, etc. Now, be blessed, and stay salty.